the difference between what's called empirical and defined process. Um, Scrum acknowledges that software is an empirical process um, and that there, because of that, there's certain characteristics um, that you want in an empirical process. The first is transparency. You want the ability to actually inspect the process, to look at it and understand the state of what's going on. That's transparency. Section is you want to engage in frequent inspection of the process and the state of the process so you know where it's at. And based on that, you want to adapt. One way to think about this is you want to have well-designed experiments. You want to frequently check those experiments. And then you want to run new experiments based on the results of those experiments. That's one way of thinking of an empirical process. Next, we talked about Scrum a little bit. We talked about the roles. And there's some important roles in Scrum. First is the product owner. Then the Scrum master, the product team, and the stakeholders. The, scrum, the, the, the product owner. The product owner is the person who maintains the vision of the product. Where is it going? They're responsible for deciding what will be done. The scrum master is there to facilitate the process, to help the team move forward effectively, and to clear any roadblocks in their way, or what are called impediments in scrum ease. Next is the product team. The product team, these are the people who decide how they're going to do what the product owner wants. It's a very clear distinction. Product owner is, this is what I want, what we need, this is what we need to meet our customers' needs. The product team is, okay, this is how we're going to tackle it, this is how we're going to make it, and this is how much work we're going to do in any quanta of time. Okay? Next, there's some artifacts. The most important artifact is a definition of done. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight because it ties into user stories, it ties into acceptance criteria. Next is a product backlog, which we will actually get into more next week. Um, and a sprint backlog, but final artifact you deliver is customer value. If you're not delivering customer value, it's a total waste. Anything that doesn't lead to customer value, directly or indirectly, is waste. So that's our real quick recap of Scrum. There's a couple other things we're gonna hit real quick. And then I'll take some questions. So this is the whole empirical process. Empirical process is inspect, adapt, inspect, adapt. That's the cycle you're constantly going through. You're inspecting, you're adapting based on that. What does this imply about the process? Well, first off, you've got to be able to inspect it, which goes back to transparency, which I already talked about. But the next is that you actually can do something with those findings from the inspection process. Can you actually change your behavior? And that's not just a can you as in is it possible, but it is are you willing as an organization to change. A lot of organizations fail at that piece. They're unwilling to change. They're unwilling to kind of face the bad news that they're seeing. So you constantly need to be inspecting. And I think this is where you have to come with unflinching honesty and look and say, this is what's good, this is what's bad, this is what's going on and then you need to adapt. And this is an ongoing process, and this expresses itself throughout the whole framework, the whole process framework that Scrum gives you. <clears throat> At the heart of Scrum is the whole idea of the sprint. And the sprint really is, it's sprint planning, sprint review, retrospective, excuse me, sprint, um, <laughs> sorry, typo, sprint planning, review, retrospective, and the, the, excuse me, sprint review, retrospective, probably, I messed this up, sorry, <laughs> my bad. But what you have is a cycle in which you plan out a sprint, you execute the sprint, you review the results of that, demonstrate that you've delivered it, you conduct a retrospective, and then you go on to plan another sprint. This is the ongoing process that you're, that you're going through. And this is what is at the core of sprint. Apologize for this slide. What is a sprint? A sprint is a time boxed, time boxed period of development, delivery of a potentially shippable product. So time boxed, it's a defined amount of time. It's every sprint, same length of time. It's time boxed. When the clock is up, it's pencils down, like an exam, if you remember that in school. Potentially shippable product. 
whatever comes out the other side of a sprint, you should be able to ship. Doesn't mean you choose to ship it, but it means that it could be shipped. Everybody clear on that distinction? So for marketing reasons, or because the support organization isn't ready, or because any of a number of things, you may not choose to ship it, but you should be able to ship it. Okay? So that means that there is something that's potentially shippable. If you come out the end of a sprint and it's, oh my God, we couldn't ship that, then something's wrong. Something is wrong. Okay? If you're going, well, no, it's not good enough, or we're missing features, or we've regressed, any of those things, then that's, that's not, that is not good. That's not what you want. It's potentially shippable. Now, whether you ship or not, that's a business decision. Be very clear that you separate engineering decisions from business decisions. Whether you ship it or not, that is a business decision. Whether you call this version 4.0 or not, that is a business decision. Whether it is ready to go and whether you've built it, that is an engineering decision. Does that make sense? So really quick, any questions on this recap? <clears throat> I know it was quick, but I want to just make sure we're all on the same page. So sprint constraints. So there's a few constraints that you apply to any sprint that are very critical for it to be successful. The first is no changes are made which endanger your sprint goal. Okay? This means that when your CEO shows up from having seen customers over the last week and says, oh, we've got to do this now. It's like, no, we already had a goal. We already have what we're working towards. We're going to finish that. And that's where you need to have a strong scrum master, someone who's going to say that, who's willing to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to take that. Now, there is a whole process for abnormally terminate a sprint, being able to move forward on that. It's all possible. But no changes are made which endanger the sprint goal. Now, remember what we said, potentially shippable product? So one of the things important there is that you're not dropping your quality goals, that you're not becoming below the targets that you had. A lot of times people are like, oh, well, let's just make it a little less good and we can get it out. You don't want to be doing that. That's not a, that is not a dial you want to be playing with. And, but here's the thing is, these, this here protects the sprint from basically feature creep. But at the same time, Part of the process, it's an empirical process, is learning and applying those learnings. Inspection, adaption. As you do the work of the sprint, you will discover things. And you need to work with the product owner to figure out the implications of that. So if you just sit there and say, sorry, we're not changing our plan. Well, that's, that's self-defeating. What, what you need to say is, we will change the plan as long as we don't endanger the goal. If what we're doing in changing this makes things better, of course we're going to do it, as long as it doesn't endanger the goal. Does that make sense? Any questions at that point? Cool. Sprint planning. So sprint planning is to define that initial scope, to get that first cut at the initial scope. That's what sprint planning is all about, okay? That is, that is what it's about, and that's the key. And at the heart of sprint planning is, what will we do, how will we do it? What will we do, how will we do it? And then there's a third one that's unstated, which is, how do we know it? What will we do, how will we do it, how will we know that we did it, that we reached it? That's what sprint planning is all about. We'll go into this much more detail because there's a lot more to this, um, but that will be next week. So your sprint plan is gonna be made up of stories and tasks. Stories are a description of customer value, of end user value. It's something an end user wants to do. Tasks, they're things you have to do, okay? Okay? And we'll talk about what, uh, how do you get a good story and how do you build it in just a second.
So going on to stories. A story has a very simple structure. The first is, as a type of user, that's the very first clause. There's three clauses here. As a, as a type of user, I want to do something. Okay? So that some value is created. As a type of user, I want to do something so that some value is created. That is the heart of what you're doing as a software engineer, as a product team, is you're taking and figuring, figuring out how to do this, how to create value for someone. Let's walk through a concrete example. As a shopper, so I think we're doing with some kind of e-commerce site, right? As a shopper, lots of e-commerce sites out there, I want to search products. So I'm a, I'm a shopper, I want to search products. So that's what I want to do. How do I create value at? So that I can find what I want. Okay? That's a very simple user story. Now this is a very, very high level user story. When you start off with this, this is the kind of story that then needs to be, as we like to say, broken down. Okay? Because this is big. This is really big and there's a lot here. It may seem like a really simple thing when you start thinking about it. Okay, so what can I search on? Can I search on name? Can I search on brand? How do I indicate it that? Can I search um, you know, on stuff that's in the description? Can I search on a price range? When you, so when I find things, how are they displayed to me? How is it sorted? Whole bunch of things. So you're gonna to wanna to take and break a story down. So let's now, as a group, let's talk about how we break this story down, okay? So I want someone to give me a, a variant of this story that breaks it down into a bigger, into a more bite-sized chunk. Any ideas? Because you're going to have to do this with a product owner. You're going to have to engage with them. Is this potentially going to change? This is probably our anchor, right? We're talking about shoppers right now. So how about this? The action you want to do. How might that change? Search by category. Search by, great, excellent. Search by category. Others. Brands, category, brand, others. That might, yes, colors might be, you know what, you might be nesting these things, yes. Um, it's correct. There's a whole bunch of things. Each one of those becomes a story. You break it down. Because here's the thing. If you break it down, then you could potentially say, okay, these are ones we can do that are easy. You know, break, by colors, hold it, do we have the metadata for color? Hmm, I don't know. That might be something we wanna do in the future, but I don't think we're well set to do that, okay? But, oh, category brand, yeah, we could do that. Um, or to search within a brand, or search within a category. I wanna search within a category for products that meet my, a particular pro category for products that have this name, okay? Or within this brand, or across a set of brands. These are all things, so you could write these stories, and you know, you all could do this. And I actually, go home tonight, and write a basic story like this, very high level. And then take some time to break it down, okay? You know, think about it, okay, what would be a refinement of this? How would I take this further? How would I develop this further? But remember, this final clause is the most important. This is the customer value. If you don't have a handle on that, you don't have, have a handle on whether you finished it or not. And don't just, you know, don't just say, as a shopper, I want to search products. 
Why do you want to search products? What are you going to do? So in fact, this would be, this might even be actually a bad final clause. Why? Well, because so that I can find what I want. But why do you want to find it? So I can buy it. Okay? So get, get as concrete as you can as you do this. Okay? So, does this make sense? This is an arc. And this is a point of tension when you're working with, product, with a product owner. Because you're going to be pushing them to get very crisp about the customer value. Very crisp. Why? Because that's going to lay the stage for the next piece. Okay? And the next piece is how do you know you've got it? Okay, now there's, when we talk about sprint planning, we're going to talk about a further breakdown, how you break it down further, um, and then how do you figure out how you're going to do it, how you're going to make it happen, and estimation. These are all things. But right now you want to get good stories, and you want to get the next piece, which is moving towards our, our, our definition of done. So when we talk about the product being done, we have code complete. Well, we need stories so we can build code. We need to be test complete, so we need to have tests. And then we need to know that we've actually met what we are, that there's some objective criteria that says we're there. That's the acceptance criteria, which then is tied to the approval by your product owner. Okay? So this is, this is a kind of a template definition of done. Every team is going to have their own definition of done. There's going to be some customization of it. But these are probably the things you do need. You need to be code complete. If it's not code complete, you're not there. If it's not test complete, if the tests aren't green, you're not there. Now, you might take that and develop it further. Acceptance criteria met. You need to know objectively what was supposed to be there to get there. And then the product owner needs to say, yeah, you've met my acceptance criteria. But you just don't want that to be an arbitrary, oh, I'm looking at it. It's like, no, it's got to be met. <clears throat> Code complete. You could expand that. Code complete could be that the code has been, has been written, um, it has been run through static analysis and passed, um, that um, it has been code reviewed. That could be your definition of code complete, okay? So it could be, you could build on it, you could grow it. Test complete, you know, hey, these, that we have unit tests that with 80% coverage. We have functional tests with 80% coverage. We have, you could, you know, build this out. You could say, oh, we have, we have user level tests with 80% code coverage. You could say we have load tests and that they have certain criteria. So these all can be developed out, but they start from these basic building blocks. Acceptance criteria is what we're gonna go into next. Because this is key. Because if you don't have an objective set of criteria, you have no way to build these tests, okay? And you have no way to know if you're there, okay? If you don't know where you're going, you have no way to know when you've arrived, okay? And yes, the journey is the reward, but you do want to know that you've got that. <clears throat> okay, acceptance criteria. I'm using a very structured way of talking about acceptance criteria here. In fact, there's a language that you can use to express it. It's called Gherkin. Um, it's tied to something called Cucumber, which is tied to behavior-driven design. I actually highly recommend you look at it and you learn about it, but the same model exists whether you do this in, quote, a programming language or you do it, you know, by hand, okay? The first is you want to talk about the feature. You want to break these down by features, and each feature should have a set of acceptance criteria. For each feature, there's scenarios, okay? And then there's conditions and potentially additional conditions. And then there's a when, which is when some action occurs, and then some result, okay? So let's walk through one of these and kind of develop it. 
In fact, we're going to start with the story we did before. And you all remember that story. So, feature product search. Scenario. My link searches for products sorted by price. Given, my lane has entered a partial or full name. In fact, and she has selected sort by price. When matching products are displayed, the products are sorted by price. Kind of captures it, right? Now, but there's ambiguity here. There's things that could be further refined. Perhaps this should not be entered a partial or full price, but you should have a different one. Entered a partial name, and then another one for full name. Two different scenarios, two different givens, okay? <clears throat> um, here, she has selected sort by price. When matching products are displayed, the products are sorted by price. So let's look at how we might evolve this and develop it. So, here's a prove it. My link searches for products sorted by price ascending. See, it's ascending, not descending. My link has entered a partial or full name. Now, I still think you could probably refine this further. She has selected sort by price and she has selected sort ascending. Matching products are displayed, then the products are sorted by from low to high price. That is actually a pretty good acceptance criteria. But we could take this, I bet you we could take this same story and come up with dozens of acceptance criteria. Because there's one of these where she sorted by, it, the scenario is sort by price descending. Price ascending, descending. Um, if you go back to the story, which is about I search for things, you could talk about the various different types of searches she could do. There would be name search. So this could be feature name, product search by name, product search by brand, product search by category. These are all further refinements of it. So right now, I want you mentally step back. For this feature, create two in your mind, two product acceptance criteria. Think about them, and then somebody be brave enough to share them. <coughs> you can talk with people. It's okay. This is not a closed book test. <laughs> Okay, someone brave? Or am I gonna have to just call on someone? <laughs> Anybody brave? I guess I'm gonna have to call on someone. Mm. How about you? You seem to you seem to be very much into it. Do you have an acceptance criteria that you, you came up with? Um, I, I'm gonna use a 
Okay. The picture is product search uh, by full name. Product search by full name. Uh, but no reason. <laughs> so scenario. So product. This is this is good. Okay. So so product search by full name. So mainland searches for product by full name. By full name. Given she has entered a full name. Yeah. And. And there's no matching result. And there's no matching result. Excellent. When matching products are displayed, then uh, sorry, there is no matching result message. Excellent. Very good. Let's give it a clap. Very good. And in fact, you hit on something I didn't talk about at all, which is the importance of negative test cases. Negative acceptance criteria. What, what happens when it doesn't work? What do we do? Just as important. Just as important. Very good, thank you very much. Anybody else? If you work for me, you might be a victim here in a minute. <laughs> Somebody else has got to have one. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, when she... So let's start from the feature. What's the feature? And product search. Product search, uh, but any, any variation on there or just product search? Product search. Okay, uh, scenario. Uh, scenario, she enters a partial name. Enters partial name. Uh, given she has entered partial name. Mm -hmm. Assuming... She hasn't hit enter or search yet. And she hasn't yet hit search. Yes. Um, maybe suggested products uh, are displayed. Okay. So yeah, so what you're basically trying to get to is like a path a, a matching, a match, a match, a partial match. Which I would say that this is probably not product search, but this is a suggestion. Search suggestion. Product search suggestion. So product search mainly is searching for products. By, by name, mailing has entered a partial name. So it's, she's searching by name, which may be full or partial, given she has entered a per partial name and has yet to hit enter. When waiting for her to hit enter, display a list of matches. Yeah, good, it's good. So again, you've got to be thinking about this. There's, there's, the thing is, what you're going to find is that for each one of these stories, you're going to break that story down. And for each of those stories, you may have dozens of these acceptance criteria. Sometimes this process of acceptance criteria is called definition by example. Or requirements by example. Because really what these are examples. You know, and think about, the, think about the conversation you're having. Okay, so now we do this. What happens? Let's unfold that. Let's walk through that and understand what happens. Let's create an example that helps us understand what you're really getting to. Because your product owner, they've got this picture in their mind. There's this little movie playing in their mind. And guess what? You don't get to watch the movie. You can't see it. Be much easier if you could, but you can't. So what you have to do is you have to get them to describe the movie. Which means it's, you've got to go and you've got to say, OK, so what happened then? What happened then? And then what? You know? Um, you know, it's kind of like listening to a really engaging story and you're hanging on every word. God, and then what happened then? Oh, okay, you know, fill it out for me. You know, when the person opened the door, what was behind the door? It's, you know, it's unpacking it that you've got to do. And that is how you get good stuff, okay? So what's going to happen, and we'll talk about this next week when we get into the sprint planning process and talk about that is what's going to happen is they're going to have defined some stories. 
And these are going to be your product backlog. And you're going to be getting ready for a sprint. And you're going to pick one of those stories that you're going to, wow, this is really big. In fact, it may be too big even for a sprint. You may end up with two sprints worth of work out of that story once you start drilling down on it. But you need to do that drill down. You need to have that conversation. Break it up into, into bite-sized chunks. So stories, when you think about them, any story or task that you tackle should be two to three days in length. Because otherwise, you, don't, you have no way to measure whether you're making progress or not. You know, if something is, is going to take five to six days, okay, five to six days, and you're in a two-week sprint, you really don't know whether you've hit it or not until you're out of the sprint. Now, the number of people that are engaged in a story, there's a lapse time, and then there's the people that are working on the task. Because you may swarm on a story. In fact, I highly recommend you swarm on stories. When you do that, then you're going to have maybe three or four people working on that in parallel and breaking it up into bite-sized chunks that they're going to tackle. And then you deliver that. And really, the complexity and the difficulty will vary based on how many people need to engage on it, not just how long it's going to take. Okay? So that's part of the thing. So you're going to take that and you're going to break that down. And then for each of those, you're going to go through this exercise of building the acceptance criteria. Even if you're not using Gherkin, I highly recommend I, using Cucumber and such, which is a great tool to use. I recommend use this structure. And in fact, run it through the Gherkin compiler to make sure that it passes, that it's lead. Because what's going to happen then is you're really, this reduces ambiguity. This structure reduces ambiguity. Okay? And really force yourself to use this, even if you're not going through the, the process of translating these into tests. Go through the process of using this to get a handle on what you're going to do. Okay? Now here's the thing. Who's responsible for writing these? The team. The team. It's a conversation. It's a conversation. You want probably three people involved in this conversation at any one time. Okay? Product owner, definitely. Got to be there. They're the one who's got the movie in their brain. Okay? Then there's people who are going to think about how do we implement that. And then there's someone who has to be thinking about all the different things you can have. Sometimes you call them a test engineer. Sometimes they're just a software engineer on the team. But somebody's need to be there who's going, who's thinking about, oh, yeah, but what about this? What about this? You want to find the person who's kind of like a, a five-year-old, but why? <laughs> Why? Why? You know, but it becomes what? 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 And drives that and pushes that. But it is a team responsibility. So last week when we did this, one of the feedbacks we got that one of the best parts of this was the Q&A time. Um, I've tried to create holes in here for questions and answers, but um, I found that also people just don't seem to like to ask those in the middle of the talks here in Singapore. So what we're going to do now is we're just actually going to go to Q&A. Um, and this is really a chance for you to bring up scenarios like, okay, how would we, you know, we tried this, but it failed. You know, why did it? Let's try to figure out why it failed. Or how would you apply it here? Or things like that. So we now go to questions. Go ahead. So when uh, breaking down a story, typically it's... How far you break it down is determined by, like, can you fit this work into three days? Two to three. Two three days. And that's kind of, that's the base criteria here. That's the, that is really, for me, how you, how you want to go down, breaking it down, is can you do it in two to three days? I mean, just kind of keep iterating until you have a high level of confidence that it's two to three days. Now, there are times when you don't know. There's just so many unknowns. And that's where you use a tool called a spike. And a spike is a special kind of story, which is the customer value there that you're producing is knowledge. The knowledge of which direction to go. Okay? It's like, gosh, we really don't know how to implement this. There's a lot of uncertainty. Then just own that uncertainty. And time box an investigation. We're going to spend 
two to three days investigating it. We're going to do this and this, and we're going to evaluate it. And the outcome, the, the v customer value produced is a decision. You know, we're going to use Cassandra to store this data. Because we don't know, right? We don't, right now, we don't know which, whether we should be using Cassandra or we should be using Basho. Okay, so we're going to do as our key value store. So we're going to um, do an investigation and this is what the investigation is going to look like. This is the data we're going to collect and then we'll make a decision based on it. And oh, by the way, we had a set of acceptance criteria that tells us how we make the decision that, you know, time must be, you know, you know, you have a bunch of acceptance criteria and you can even use this, this, you know, this format for them, you know, result must be within, you know, this. And, you know, you can even have one at the end that says, and all things being equal, we're going to go with Cassandra. Okay? That's the final acceptance criteria. If all other things are equal, we go with Cassandra. You know, just because we like it better, you know. But again, it makes things very clear, very objective. Other questions? So, you, so this goes back to this question here, which is, how should you be breaking these down? And you should be breaking these down into two to three chunk, day chunks. Now, I know, I've been there. There will be times where you thought it was two to three days, and it turned out to be more. At that point, break it down more. When you have that data, you know, just own it. Just say, okay, we didn't, we didn't nail this. We didn't know this. Let's, we need to break this down further. Let's do that, okay? Um, and then, you know, deal with that fact. But, yeah, if, if a store... Uh, so it's all right to deliver a feature or an epic across multiple sprints. It's just make sure that you have something going back potentially shippable, okay? And that you're delivering some customer value. So guess what? To do, if we'd gone with the story, which is that the very first story I did, which is um, I could, you know, I, I find pr product, you know, as a shopper, I can find, I find the products, I, I search for the products I want so that I can find the things I want to buy. That is, that's a huge story. It's a huge story. We, as we unpacked it, we found that that could deal with how do you sort the results and display them. We, we dealt with negative cases. We nailed with name, names, categories, brands, you know, other metadata that you'd be searching on. We dealt with um, suggestions. All can fall under that story. So break it down. Break it down into more precise pieces. More, more clearly understood pieces. The, the thing is, is when we're building software, we're going from a point of no understanding of what the person wants to hopefully full understanding of what the person wants as captured in software we built. Okay? So the question is, how do we get there? And, you know, when I started out in this, in this business, we, we had a term, I don't know if they still teach it in computer science, stepwise refinement. Stepwise refinement. So what we do is we start with something and you break it up and you, you break it into more pieces. And this was the basis for, at that time, writing functions or procedures. Okay? You're like, you know, you want to you do something, you break it down, you break it down, you break it down, until you could get it into a single function or procedure. And that would be the step. I still kind of use that approach, you know, whether I'm working in Ruby or Python, Ru you know, that's kind of how my Ruby methods are built, is I, I break it down, and it's like, okay, I, I want to be able to basically say something like, you know, do foo, and I have a method to do that, you know, and I keep breaking down until I get to that point. Same thing here, it's kind of, you know, do X, make sure you have it broken down into those steps. Other questions? What should be the ideal duration of the sprint running? How long you should last? 
So I think when you add up everything, all the overhead for a sprint, you, you want to be below 5%. You want to be below 5%. So if you're, if you're doing stand-up, you know, those 15 minutes a day, you got that. Then you need to look at a year or two. Um, I think, you know, for retrospectives, I'm really hard-assed about, about time boxing. Uh, for uh, sprint reviews, I'm really, really hard-assed about time boxing. For sprint planning, it's like you're gonna adjust that, that number. But I think you do wanna do time boxing. I think the other thing which we didn't talk about, which we'll talk about next week, is something that's not an official part of Scrum, but what it, some people call story time, which is, a, is an ingredient to maintaining a good, healthy backlog. The thing is, is you don't want all these stories broken down. You know, you don't want to have six months of stories that are actionable sitting in your pipeline, in your backlog. Because the reality is you're going to throw 90% of them away. So you do, you want to go from a state of, you know, kind of fuzzy definition, big chunks, to when you intake them and you jump into a sprint, they're more broken down. So you also have not just sprint planning, but you have this story time that's kind of an ongoing process where you kind of say, hey, and this is a process where the, pro the product owner says, hey, I'm thinking about stuff along this line. Here's some of the stories I'm thinking about. And you could start asking questions at that point. And then they go, oh, I hadn't thought about them. Let me go talk to some customers. Maybe I need to do some user research. Um, maybe I just need to think about that. Maybe I need to sit down with the product designer and play with some ideas. You know, um, it's better that those questions be raised earlier rather than later. Um, and so that means you have, you can't just throw it all into the, the, the sprint planning time. So, uh, two questions. One is, how do you dedicate time for task fixing in a sprint? And typically, uh, what do you always do? Is that 30%, 30%, 30%? Second one would be, Okay, so the first question is about how do you deal with bug fixes? So tasks, I treat them as, I treat bug fixes as tasks. And you, you put them into the backlog. And you manage them. That would be, that is the ideal, okay? Um, I think that how much time you spend is really a factor of the customer value that's being delivered. Um, if, your, if your product owner is like, oh my God, these are really horrible, we have to deal with them. Maybe you have a sprint that all you do is fix bugs. Because that's the customer value you're going to deliver. A you know, more solid, more robust, more reliable product. Um, I think that that is the product owner. Um, I think what you'll tend to find is about 20 to 25% is what on a kind of a mature product is what you're going to see. But that's just a rule of thumb. Depends on your code base. Now one of the things I'll say is bugs that are tied to the stories you're implementing, that's part of implementing the story, okay? And you, you, just, you, but you just write them and you put them into the sprint. You just write the bugs up, you put them in the sprint, okay? So that's, you know, that's, but again, it's going back to acceptance criteria. Are you meeting the acceptance criteria or not, okay? Um, you know, if you're gonna do something like a refactor, that's a task, you know? But what is that enabling? I mean, there are some of us who we look at something and we just have to get our hands to refactor it. We just, you know, our skin's crawling. But we have to ask ourselves, are we really de delivering customer value in that? Because I'm one of the people whose skin ends up crawling sometimes. And I have to pull myself in and say, no, there's not, yes, it will make me feel better, my skin will crawl less, but really we're not delivering any customer value, okay? Um, you know, that's, that's the reality. Um, so we have to ask ourselves that question. And that's where the PO comes in the PO decides what gets done. The team decides how it gets done and how long it takes and how much they're going to commit to. Okay? So there's a tension there. And that's a good tension. Okay? By separating those things. Now, if you have a PO who is saying things like, well, in, five, in four weeks you're going to ship this. And they're setting, they're, they're committing it. And they haven't talked to you. And all you have is a very high level story. You need to very gently push back and say, 
I love the fact that you aspire for us to deliver that, that, that feature in that time. But I don't think we can commit to that. Okay? There will always be attention. The POs, your product owners, your product managers are going to push you. They want more. They want it sooner. They're seeing a path forward. That vision that they're tracking to, they have that movie in their mind that is so clear to them that, you know, you need, they, they, but you need to say, hey, let's figure out how we're going to make that movie happen. Okay? Um, I remember reading famous movie director, and I can't remember who it was, and the interview was that he said that every day before he would come on the set, he would actually visualize every scene they were going to film that day. But then it sometimes took 20 takes to get his scene made reality. So for you, your PO, your product manager, is going to have all these scenes in their mind. And, but the thing is, it may take you guys 20 takes to get them right. You know, but imagine that the script wasn't even written. You know, you guys are having to write the script at the same time. It's not like you have a written script. Okay? This tension is good. So don't get me wrong, this tension is good. It's a powerful tension. You know, what you ideally want in product and engineering are two people who are very passionate about what they can do, can disagree with each other, maybe even raise their voices in the conversation. But at the end, they come out and they say, this is what we're doing. That's what you want. So it's okay that they're arguing. It's okay that voices get raised. It's okay that maybe even tables get pounded on. But what happens at the end is there's an, there, is a, there is a commitment to move forward. You know, Amazon talks about disagree and then commit. That's the model they talk about. This is what you're talking about here. Second question. So the question is, what happens when you need a separate design sprint? So first off, that's part of what should be coming into the grooming process, is thinking about what this is going to look like, what the interaction is going to be, because it goes back to acceptance criteria. But you also may say, hey, what we're producing is we're producing something that can be tested. We're producing something that could be the result, is something that's testable. Again, acceptance criteria. Go back to acceptance criteria. Is this something that can be used to val validate this user experience? Okay? You know, again, customer value can be understanding of the customer if it lets you make good decisions going forward. Okay? Cool. Others? My question? Yes? When does performance become an acceptance criteria? When is it critical that it should be part of the acceptance criteria? Question is, when does, accept, does performance become part of the acceptance criteria? Just now the product search, they yeah. can put in a partial name, but it might take five minutes to get better results. So that's what part of your criteria. Yeah. That's part of your result displayed within 500 milliseconds. It could be one of your. It, it, you should talk about. You should t say what is acceptable. You should say what is acceptable. You know, is this a potentially shippable product? Is that you? If it is five minutes, is that usable? No. Okay, it's not. I mean, let's just be honest. We know. You know, Jacob Nielsen's research. Um, Donald Norman's research on how quickly people bounce away, very clear, you've got no more than two seconds. And for something like this, you know, this is measured in, you know, tens, hundreds or tens of milliseconds in terms of how quickly it has to be there to be, to be you know, how long does it take to press a key and change, you know, and give that feedback. You've got to be able to press the key, see the feedback, press a key, see a feedback, you know, if it's not there. The question is, is it critical to the user acceptance? Now, if you're saying, oh, we're going to 
we're going to do a proof of concept of recommendation, then that's a different thing. But be clear about what the criteria are for what you're trying to do, okay? But performance, I think it's, it's you know, you don't want to premature optimize, but you know, to de deliver something and say that it's good, then you've got to measure the performance. And again, it's about what's acceptable, not what's the best, okay? What's acceptable versus what's the best. You know, we may say that, you know, we, the, the ideal for something like this would be 50 milliseconds, which I think is about right. Um, but in that case where we say, okay, but 250 is acceptable, okay? If you don't know what it is, you're never gonna reach it. If you haven't talked about it, there will be disagreement. You will get to the end and your PO is gonna say, this is unacceptable. And you're gonna say, well, why didn't you tell us? Okay? Because you might come at the very beginning of sprint planning and if they set 50 milliseconds as the, the criteria, you know enough about the architecture to know you cannot deliver that right now. Should you accept that story? No, we should say, we can't do that. I wish we could, but we can't, you know? And this is why. And then figure out why, what you do to make that happen. I mean, these are not easy conversations to have. These are hard and painful conversations. We all want to deliver good stuff. We want all people to say, yes, you've done it. So when you tell them, I can't do it, it's not, it's not pretty. But it's how you have healthy product discussions. Next. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the computer for acceptance test. Uh, actually, it's very similar to your integration test. I know they, 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 have different, they have different proposals, but technically, I, I think they are very similar. So, can I deeply replace one with another? So, the, so the, the question is around integration tests versus acceptance tests. Sounds like they're similar. These are names, these are labels we put on them. Just make sure you as a team are agreed on what, your, what it means. When you say unit test, everybody better know what that is. When you say functional test, everybody on the team should know what that means. When someone says user level test or acceptance test or integration or system test, just make sure you know what you're talking about, that you're in agreement. You know, you can call it, you can call it, you know, spark, star spangled nonsense, you know, whatever, you know, pick out a term for yourselves. Just make sure everybody knows what that means. Okay? I mean, this is an area where there is a lot of different terminology. Um, there, people, you know, you know, they're not really good at defining it. It's, I know it when I see it, you know, um, it kind of, kind of phrase. But at the same time, it's important as a team, go back to the acceptance criteria, that you know that you're talking about the same thing. You know, if you say integration test, and what you really mean is a functional test, and I say acceptance test, and what I really am saying is a user level test, you know, and we, you know, and we never have the discussion to work out what we both mean, you know, you're gonna deliver a set of integration tests, and I'm gonna go, what the, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> You know, you know, just make sure that you, you know, and that, you know, going back, that's, that's definition of done. That's make sure that you're speaking the same language. Others? Uh, should we limit our storage account based on our existing resource in order to maintain the user expectation? So should you make, should you, should you manage or manage your story breakdown based on your resources? Yeah. I mean, here's the reality. If you only have five, three people on the team, you should, you should be planning for three people. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I don't get resource fairies that come and drop resources in my teams in the middle of sprints. And you know, you should, you should, you should take into account things like is someone going to be on an extended leave? 
Okay? Um, you know, that, you know, you know I, I, I can't tell you how many teams I've seen go into a sprint planning and everything, and then the day after the sprint starts, oh, but by the way, John and, G and, and Jeannie, they're, 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 on, they're on leave for two weeks. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> Very helpful, you know. And, and you know, take into account, you know, what are the demands that are on people, you know? Who's gonna be there? I mean, it's a team that's gonna tackle this work. And, you know, you know and, don't, and don't expect that person who joins that week to contribute, you know, full on to the sprint. Again, another thing I've seen teams go, oh yeah, so, so and so is joining on Monday. Well, they'll be able to handle these three stories. Well, first off, you should not say that they'll be able to handle those stories because they didn't have anything to say in that conversation. Okay? You know, just like you wouldn't want the PO to say, well, God, you guys can handle nine stories, can't you? <laughs> That's not the PO's place. The person needs to be part of a conversation if you're going to do that. Yeah, scale things to your resources. Scale things to your resources. And don't expect magic resources to appear. You know? Um, I don't know. If, there's a cartoon series in the US um, that was very popular, very nerdy, called The Far Side. I don't know if people ever saw it. If you look it up, it's kind of fun. But there's one, there's one Far Side cartoon. A lot of them were about science. Um, you know, different things in science. Um, and in one of them, there's this person, you know, working at a whiteboard, da 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 laying out these equations. And then in the middle of it, it says, a miracle occurs, and the rest of the equation is below it. <laughs> and I sometimes think that in software development, we're kind of like, yeah, we, we've got this clearly defined, we've got this clearly defined, we just need a miracle here to fill it in for us. <laughs> and, you know, and we keep expecting a miracle to happen. <laughs> And they keep not happening, and we keep getting hurt. And so we, let's just quit planning on miracles happening. There, there, is no, there is no resource ferry. There is no testing ferry. There is no key, QA ferry. Um, you, know, you know, let's just quit pretending that, that, that there are. Great. Other questions? Well, we promised that these would be an hour, um, and we're at an hour and four minutes. So I'm um, going to call it for tonight, unless there are any other questions. Look forward to seeing you back here next week. Um, next week, we will be um, talking about the whole sprint planning process, um, estimation, sprint planning, all that kind of stuff. OK? Um, and then we'll, um, week four, we'll wrap it all together. So thank you very much. Good evening. Oh, by the way. We are hiring here at Carousel. If you'd be interested in being part of our software engineering team, um, feel free to give us your name. If you know anybody who would be, point them at us, okay? We actually have um, a referral bonus for people outside of Carousel who referred people to us. <laughs> Self-referrals are not, do not get the referral bonus. So if you're gonna do that, you know, get a friend to refer you and then collect the money from them. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.